So in this video, let's learn about recurrent neural networks, how they work, how they learn, and also some of the improvements that were made on them over time. So let's get started. A nice thing to do before we start talking about RNNs is to remember how neural networks look like. So if you remember in a normal neural network or a deep neural network, you can call it, uh, we have an input layer, a hidden layer, and an output layer. And information runs sequentially. So first the information comes to the input layer, then it is passed to the hidden layer, and then finally the output is produced. So all of the data points that you have, you give them at the same time, all of the features of your uh, specific data point that you're training on. The difference in neural networks of recurrent neural networks is that they are recurrent. So that means that the same thing happens over and over again in a way. Um, so this is what a recurrent neural network looks like when it's unrolled. And I will also show you the rolled firm. But basically what you need to know is that each of these little sections are actually uh, one of the same. They're the same network or they are the same neurons. So what happens is these are all the different input features and you give them one after another. So you first give the first feature of your input, an output is calculated and also passed to the second time step, we call them time steps, and then the second feature of your input data input or a data point is given, including the output of the first one, another output is calculated, and so on and so forth. So when you put it, in, when you show it as it is actually and how it is, is that it is just one unit. So what happens is you give it an input, output is calculated, but at the same time output is passed again, the second feature of the input is given. So when you compare it to neural networks, what happens is in neural networks you give all of the features at the same time, whereas in recurrent neural networks you give all of the features one step at a time. So it is basically things happen in a time step manner. So we would call this the first time step, the second time step, third, fourth, and fifth time step. So basically in each of these time steps, except the first one, you have two inputs. One of them is the output from the previous time step and one of them is the input of this time step. So how do we calculate the output of recurrent neural networks? Well, we do it with this formula. It's actually quite simple, even though it looks like a complicated math formula thing. Uh, you have weights for your inputs. So for each time step, you have the weights. And for all of the outputs from the previous step, you have another set of weights and you also have the biases. All of this is of course passed through an activation function and at the end you have the output of your recurrent neural network. One thing to understand here is that even though we have, it looks like we have many steps, as I said, it's actually just one unit. So WX and WY, which are the weights of the previous, the output of the previous layer and the input of this layer or time step, is the same because they're actually the same. Here we're just showing them in an unfurled way because it's easier to understand. So there's only one set of um, weights for the input and one set of weights for the output. So there is a very common way of showing cells of uh, RNNs because these cells here, how the output is calculated can be different. And we will talk about different types of cells too, but let's talk about how to depict a simple RNN cell. So what we normally have, of course, as we talked about, the input, uh, the output from the previous step, time step, and the input of this time step. So these t's basically depict this time step. T is this time step. T minus one is the previous time step. So to show this formula on a diagram, we can say, okay, there is a multiplication happening here. This is multiplied with wy, and here another multiplication. And this is multiplied with wx. And then we also add the bias here. So that's why, you know, the crosses and the pluses here. And this all goes through an activation function, of course. And very commonly what's used is the hyperbolic tangent function. Um, but of course you can use other things too. But generally hyperbolic tangent function is the one that is being used with simple RNNs. And at the end, we pass the output of this time step to the next time step. And also we output it. But... Sometimes this is not the case. So for simplest of RNN cells, this is the case where you pass the output to the outside world and also to your next time step. But sometimes you do an extra step on before you output something. So you maybe pass it through a softmax function if you want it to be between zero and one instead of minus one and one, because that's what the hyperbolic tangent function where it will produce. Uh, then basically what you pass to the next state will not go through the softmax function, that extra step, 
and then it will still pass it to the next function or next time step. So it still is the same thing, but has seen less processing. So then what happens is we call this the hidden state of this time step. So the hidden state of this time step is passed to the next time step. So this is just a uh, interesting difference to keep in your mind that you do not always just pass the output that you get to the next time step, but sometimes we call it the hidden, hidden state. There are, of course, a bunch of ways how you can use this uh, architecture because you do not always have to pass all of your or uh, output all of the outputs that you calculate in your cells. So let's look at a couple of different options. The first type is sequence to sequence RNN model. So basically for every input that you give in each time step, you get an output for that time step. And for these kind of things, you can use for things that where you're forecasting things. So for example, price, pr price forecasting or stock exchange forecasting sort of things. Uh, the second one that you can use is called sequence to vector. Sometimes it's called sequence to single because you only get one output at the end of the whole RNN uh, network that you have. Um, and these things that you use for, let's say you have a sentence or you have an email and at the end of the, or as an output of the model, what you want to know is, is it scam or not? Or for example, sentiment analysis, like what kind of sentiment does it have? Is it negative or positive? That kind of things. So for that, in each time step, you give your network a input and then you just ignore the outputs. Even if it's producing the outputs, you do not look at them. The only output that you look at is the one at the end because before seeing the whole sentence, your model cannot come to a conclusion, of course. Another one that you have is vector to sequence, or as I said, single to sequence. Uh, by the way, the reason that they are not called single but vector here is that because the output that you have is in the form of a vector most of the time, and it is not just a single number. That's why we just call it vector instead of single, but both ways are fine. So in vector to sequence sort of architectures, what you're doing is you're giving the network one input and you are letting it output a sequence of things. So this could be, for example, you give your network an image and then you're having it output a explanation of that image word by word. So let's say you give a photo of a dog running on a beach then for each of these time steps, the network will output a dog running on the beach, for example. So those are the kind of things that you would use a vector to sequence uh, architecture for. And lastly, we have encoded decoder sort of architecture. So in these kind of architectures, RNN architectures, at first you are only giving the, your network inputs. So input, input, input for a couple of time steps or how many uh, ever that you need and then you get outputs. So, and then in the second part, you only get outputs, you do not give any inputs. And these kind of architectures are good for translation because to translate a sentence, your network needs to see the whole sentence first because meaning of some words might change, the translation of some words might change if you uh, see the whole sentence based on the context. So that's why you first give it the whole sentence and then you give the get the translation word by word on the decoder part. All right, but how does RNNs uh, learn? So how does the training work? It's actually quite simple. It's very similar to normal neural networks that do not have any interesting architecture, uh, but we just call it backpropagation through time. So what happens is the output of the network is calculated, of course, and we do it in, you can think of it as like it's unrolled for, uh, form. So at first you give it input as a zero, and then, uh, or the hidden states from the previous time step because it doesn't exist as zero. You give the first input, you get a first output. You give the second input, you get a second output. And then you just calculate which, whatever you wanna calculate. And then we calculate the cost of this uh, network. But as we said in the previous slide, sometimes the network, how you use the net network might change. So you might want to ignore the first couple of outputs or you, maybe you're just interested in the last two outputs or maybe even you're just interested in the last one. So based on that, the cost is calculated. And then based on that, as we did with normal neural networks, we calculate the gradient and then the gradient is passed back uh, through the network and the weights are updated. But as we said, all the weights of all of these time steps are actually the same because they're actually one time step. And then the gradients are calculated as we do with normal neural networks. And then these gradients are passed back in the network to update the weights. 
But as I said, you might ignore some of the outputs while you're calculating costs. So the gradients are passed back only through the ones that you uh, used in the cost calculation. So RNNs are actually really good for analyzing sequential data. So this could be uh, time series data, text or audio files, for example. But of course, they have some shortcomings. So the first one is that they have unstable gradients. Um, and you can imagine that, right? Because it's a very long sequential sort of architecture. So the further back you go in this architecture, um, the smaller your gradients are going to get. So you might not be able to update the weights on the previous timestamps uh, in a way, or to previous time steps in a way that will be helpful for the whole network. Uh, what you can do for this problem in RNNs is use other techniques that we use for normal neural networks too, or just deep neural networks too, to deal with unstable gradients. Or you can use la layer normalization instead of batch normalization because batch normalization is not as effective with recurrent neural networks. So they're kind of tricky to apply to recurrent neural networks. So instead you can use layer normalization. And another problem with simple RNN cells is that they forget. If you give it a very long sentence, uh, it tends to forget what was being said at the beginning of the sentence. So the applications that are created with it are not really effective or they don't work as well. So instead we have the LSTM or GRU cells that we can use to uh, make sure that we still remember the beginning of a sentence at the end of it. So let's see what a LSTM cell looks like. If you remember how I showed you in that diagram, the RNN uh, architecture, the simple RNN cell looks like, it will be easier to understand this one here. So what we have is a couple of sigmoid activation functions. And then we have another hyperbolic activation function. And you know, we he here see that there are two hidden uh, states that are passed from the previous time ste step to us. And then we again pass those two different hidden states to the next time step. Uh, and then we again have an input and then we have an output. So let's look closely what all of these things mean. So the first things that we need to understand here is that, as I said, we have two hidden states coming and going to the previous and next time steps. The first one is the previous one, as we talked about, is just a hidden state from the previous step. But the other one, C, is a long-term memory hidden state. So basically, as you say, there are less things happening to this hidden state and we either forget or add some things to this long-term hidden state and it passes to the next time step without much uh, coming out of it or going into it. Um, why do I know or how do I know things are being added or extracted from these time steps? Well, because uh, we have the forget gate here, we have the input gate here, and we have the output gate here. So basically these are the gates that create the information workflow or the how this information is used in this specific time step. So let's talk a little bit more in detail about that. So what we have here are called gate controllers. So anything other than the hyperbolic tangent function, we call the gate controllers. And what the gate controllers do is they either input zero or one. And in this way, they determine if something is going to be forgotten, if something is going to be input, or something's going to be output from the long-term state. And how this works is basically in the forget gate, we decide which part of the long-term memory should be removed from the long-term memory. So, you know, we're saying, okay, this can be forgotten now. We don't need to understand, we don't need to remember this information anymore. In the input gate, we decide which part of the hidden state or the information that we just added to the hidden state needs to also be passed on to the long-term memory. So we're deciding, okay, Okay, actually this piece of information is important to remember later. And in the output gate, we decide which part of the long-term state we need to extract from the long-term state right now and use as an output, either as in the hidden state to pass on the next timestamp or as an output in this or as part of the output that we generate in this uh, time step. So it sounds kind of complicated, even though it's sort of intuitive that there is one long-term memory, one short-term, shorter-term memory, and then we either forget things from the long-term one, either use it or add new things. And it's kind of confusing to understand, okay, but like how does this thing whole work? Why do, why do we forget input or how does the forgetting and inputting happen? Um, but you don't have to understand everything behind it. You don't have to understand how it's all working. Basically, 
what you need to know is that it is working and this is the intuition and I think that will get you uh, where you need to go. So you don't have to obsess over how this whole works. So another different kind of cell that we have is called the GRU cell. GRU cell is basically like a simplified version of the LSTM cell. You know, you have less things happening here. You do not have a separate output. As you can see, the hidden state that is passed to the next time step and the output is exactly the same. And here the gate controller R decides which part of the previous state will be shown in the main layer. So main layer being uh, the one where we pass through the hyperbolic tangent and basically the main state that is being passed to the next time step. The R decides which part of the previous state that we got from the previous time step is added to the timestamp and the output of this or the state and the uh, output of this time step. And that's it. That's kind of like a first step at RNNs, kind of beginner level information that you need to know. If you want to learn more about RNNs and deep learning in general, go check out my course Deep Learning 101. I will leave the link in the description below. Before you leave, don't forget to give me a like and maybe even subscribe to show your support. I would also love to hear your opinions about this video or any questions that you have in the comment section below. But for now, thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video.